Let's let the ushers come here for a second. And I want to just take a pause for a minute and thank you for your faithfulness and giving. We have, uh, uh, this church is, uh, you know, in transition uh, from the previous pastors and wives to us. And, and uh, I'm amazed at how you have sustained your giving and how, how we've uh, all been blessed. And we've got great plans ahead that we've got, it's going to take a ton of money. <laughs> well, I think we have to build a barn for the kids' ministry out there and uh, attach it with a playground that's a little, little bit like uh, Knott's Berry Farm. I don't know. We're going <laughs> to... The good news is we have plenty of money, and the bad news is it's still in your pockets, so... <laughs> <laughs> What a thrill, though, to contribute to the kingdom, okay? Just so you know, it's a thrill. And uh, let's pray and ask God to bless this and uh, really uh, make it meet the needs we have. Jesus, thank you. You have been so faithful to us, and we're so grateful. And we just stand here in awe of you and what you've done. And we are just honored to contribute to your kingdom and to ex see the kingdom expanded into places that we have not yet even dreamed about. And we thank you for that. Would you bless each person here today uh, uh, in every way in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, offering music. If you're lost and stumbling. No. Oh, I like that one. Let's do it. Okay, I got to start lower, though. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Shiloh Spontaneous Choir. Mm. That's well done. We're in uh, <clears throat> First Corinthians, going through a series on living the Jesus life. Our culture is all about living the best life. And you might have heard that. It's been since the 90s. Every, the best life has been kind of, are you living your best life? Everybody's living their best life. <clears throat> I want to explain to you something today. God wants you to live a Jesus life. And it is, might not be the easiest life, just FYI, but it is the best life. It is the life you're called to live, and it's the one I'm called to live. I want you and I to just know that today. And we're going, <laughs> we've been talking about marriage and issues of, that were in the church in Corinth sexuality issues. I'm so glad we're moving on. You're, you can just take a breath of fresh air today. We're not talking about awkward subjects other than not causing people to stumble. That's where we're at today. <clears throat> because in, uh, in this church in Corinth, they wrote Paul and asked him, hey, would you answer some questions about some things we don't know? That's how we got the, the, the last two weeks, the topic of sexuality. They had real honest questions about how to behave themselves and live. And <clears throat> Paul addresses uh, another of their questions, and I know that by the, how it begins, because he goes, now about food sacrificed to idols. And so I can imagine the question that was posed to him was, hey, what do we do? We got some people that like to eat the bargain idol food. Uh, meat was already sacrificed to the idols, and so it was like half price at the grocery outlet. I don't know where it was, but it was, it, it was a bargain. And so how many here can resist a bargain? See, not many. 
And so they were buying us up, but it was offending some of the other people. Like, they were tripping over the idea that you are eating meat that's been offered to idols. So let's read his answer to their question. What do we do about that? In 1 Corinthians, we're going to start in, at the very beginning. Now, about food offered to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. A shorter version of verse 2 would be people don't know as much as they think. Verse 3, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food, sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, in quotation marks, and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everybody possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, and I, I don't, it's not, a, it's not trashing those folks. It's just saying that's a sensitive area for them, okay? It is defiled, but the food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Verse 9, be careful, however, that you exercise your rights it does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Be careful. We have five guiding values in our church, in our family of churches, and uh, one of them is to be spiritually awake and aware. And I think uh, we want to be full of God's spirit, but sometimes you get a label on you like you're a spirit-filled person, and that's great, but I want that label to be more practical and to uh, have us be spiritually awake and to understand what is happening, to be aware of the kingdom, to be aware of what is really happening, okay? So this is about being spiritually awake and aware of others, okay? So be careful, however, that you exercise your rights, uh, that as you exercise your rights, it's not become a stumbling block to the weak. Um, I was raised in a really wonderful Christian home. My dad had accepted Christ as a young adult, as well as my mom. My mom had a, had a daughter when my dad met her, and they got married, and I am the seventh child of their marriage. Yeah. My dad, if he were alive today, would be 112. He was kind of a geezer when I was born. <laughs> he went through the Great Depression. Uh, in his conversion experience, he left a life of gambling, party life, smoking and drinking, Carrying on. So in his mind, when he left that life, all of those things were like the worst things he could ever do. And I know that we don't feel that way today about many of those things. It's just... When we wanted to play cards because dad was, had a gambling problem. When we wanted to play cards, we would have to wait till he went to bed and then drag out the cards and play. My brothers would hide beer in the barn. <laughs> because if dad caught him, it was not good. Can I explain something to you? This was my dad's history and his background. And it's just 
the way he was. And I, I'm, I'm not saying he was a bad guy at all, but those were the areas that were sensitive to him. And those were the things that were difficult for him to get past. And so he passed it on to us a little bit. Okay, how do we cause people not to stumble? And I want to talk to you today both as a person who is a stumbler and as a person who is a, um, a stumbly. Is that a word? No, probably not. The, the tripper, a stumbler. Thank you. I'm glad you're in the front row because there's more problems coming too that you can help me with. <laughs> because you and I both know we can, we can be so worried about what everybody thinks all the time that we're just locked up and that we can't operate or move. And that's not what this is about. Paul the Apostles addressing this church that had a segment of this church that was having a difficult time with people just eating meat that was offered to idols like it was no big deal because they had left the life of idol worship. They had left a life of doing those things, and so for them it was a big deal. To the people who had never been experienced in offering meat to sacrificed idols, no big deal. So you see where this comes into today's life because you and I are supposed to understand <laughs> what is going on around us and I'm just telling you it's so hard to do and I think the key to the thing is number one point just love God now if you love God you'll be aware of other things if you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about God if you if you ask God to bless you in the day at the beginning or if you pray and ask him to Bless your past day and, and into your night as you go to sleep. My wife and I name each child and each grandchild every night when we go to sleep in our prayer because we want to hold them up before the Lord. We're aware of God and we're asking God to not just bless them but lead them. And we pray specific prayers for each one of them often. Sometimes there's different ones going through things that we, we kind of zero in on. Can I just tell you, we're aware because we love God so much and we want them to know God and love him. And so we want to have that awareness. See, if you love God, it'll make you uh, become more like Jesus. It, it, it happens. It, it's just a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but as you journey on with God and you continue to love him and you continue to pursue him, I, I just love the men's breakfast on Thursday morning. I hear about it all the time. I can't make it because I'm obligated elsewhere, but I just hear about the answers to prayer and the different things and the, the, the great discussions that take place after the initial discussions about, I don't know, wheel lines and irrigation and cows. Um, in Acts 4.13, Peter and John were preaching to the people who had just crucified Jesus. And when they got done, this is what was stated about them. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13. They knew that these guys had been with Jesus. As we interact with people and as we try really hard not to cause people to stumble or to stumble ourselves, we have to understand something. We have to be with Jesus and understand who he is and make sure who Christ is, is dominant in our life. If it is, you will be so less offensive. <laughs> so uh, my wife used to be on a bowling league. And I don't smoke, and I've got family members that do, but I don't. And I'm not saying that in a righteous way. I just... 
she would bowl and come crawling into bed at 11 o'clock at night, smelling like a bowling alley. <laughs> Whew. I don't know. It wasn't just the smoke, because that was in the days when you could smoke everywhere. I'm sorry for you who smoke and you can't go anywhere and smoke now, because we used to go to basketball games in high school in Montana, and there's a blue smoke coming out and <laughs> trying to see the basketball, and there's, you know, it's just. <laughs> You'd go on an airplane and there was a smoking section, so, so you could sit there and smoke. It's like, oh, good, you can sit there and smoke and all drift over. And <clears throat> so those days of that freedom are kind of missing now, but unless you go to Europe or somewhere. But Lila came crawling in bed smelling like bowling alley. It was a combination of the, of the smoke and the oil on the lanes, and the shoes. <laughs> I love this verse. Let me tell you, verse 13 of Acts 4. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They could tell who they were with. You are giving off an aroma, too, of who you're with. So when we're dealing with trying to have people do well in our lives and not stumble and, and us not stumbling, and when we have this desire to live a way that blesses people and encourages people and helps people, I'm telling you, you need to spend time with Jesus and know who he is because that will help you in your journey and in your relationships. Because they're going to know who you're with. You, you've talked to the people. You can tell by talking to somebody out there outside of these walls, probably, or probably inside of these walls, who their, what their favorite uh, news channel is. You can tell. You can sp spot them a mile away. It just happens. I'm just telling you that today is a, is a day in which the body of Christ, the people of God, need to spend time with Jesus. So that's the initial impact, and that's the aroma that we're giving off. It's not an aroma of our viewpoint politically. It's not an aroma of our favorite things. It's an aroma of our relationship with Jesus and who he is. And we'll come across people, and they'll be struggling in an area, and the last thing they need to do is have you trip them. They need you to love them. So if you love God, it will make you more like Jesus. Second thing is we need to be aware. Verse 9 uh, says, be careful, however, that you exercise your rights. It does not become a stumbling block to the weak. I don't know why my throat's choking up today. It's just the way it is. It's the snow, I guess. I don't know. Being aware, being aware is a growth issue as a follower of Jesus. Having a sensitivity of how people are doing around you. I, 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 am, I am really bad at this, and so are you. <laughs> it's just the way we are. We're humans. And sometimes it's hard for us to be aware. We have all the good intentions in the world. We were, uh, had a funeral for a family, uh, and, and they were, they had Jewish, half of them were Jewish, and they, and they had a large family there and a gathering, and we decided we would do, a, we would bless them with providing a meal for them after church, and we didn't know any better, but we made sausage soup. <laughs> and they're going through line, and I'm serving it to them, and what's in this? Oh, it's, it's delicious. I said, I know. That's my wife. It's called wedding ring soup. It's made with oh, sausage and stuff. And they're just like, oh. <gasps> we didn't know. We had just defiled a whole bunch of them. <laughs> it wasn't our intention. They were very gracious. They said, oh, that's OK. We'll just have a little salad from here on out. <laughs> um, if we can figure this out 
to where we are walking with Jesus and, and we give off his aroma and who he is in our life and people will know that we've been with him. And then we have a growth of being aware of people, how they are with us and how we're interacting with them. We can, we can develop a sensitivity by the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Holy Spirit in regards to our relationships around us, who, who, how people are doing and what they need. It will help us in this area, okay? And so it's, it's, instead of causing people to stumble, we'll actually cause them to stand, I had a brother-in-law, Steve Stern. Some of you know him. He lived in Bend and passed away with ALS seven years ago. Seems like yesterday. He was more than a brother-in-law. We were just really close friends. And he was an assistant pastor his whole life. He loved being an assistant pastor. He loved... He would drift in and out of business, and when he was in the business world, he was an assistant to the owner of the company. He was, he was the guy who blessed people with giving them an assist. He was the one who would help people stand. The word assist, I spoke this at his funeral because I said he was the best person of being an, giving an assist to someone that I've ever known. And the word assist means to help stand. It's complete opposite of causing someone to stumble. It comes from the Middle English word assistant, to help, aid, give aid to, listen to this part, to take up a position near, stand by, Stand by as a supporter or an advocate. To take up a position near. This is the opposite of what Paul was dealing with in this church. And so he was trying to address them. Don't cause people to stumble. But rather than just causing them to stumble, take up a position next to them and cause them to stand. Have them stand. It was a difficult disease. My brother-in-law had ALS. And for some reason, his legs worked until the end. Never happens hardly. Most often, that usually is the first to go. He was in a wheelchair because he couldn't, he didn't have any strength. And he, I think he weighed like, you know, he's under 100 pounds now. And he started out at 200 And the final day of his life on this earth, I helped him stand. It was such a privilege to stand beside him as we changed his bed stuff and got him around, got him ready for the day. And he stood, and I got to stand with him. For once, I got to assist him. For once, I got to do what his whole life calling had been, to assist others, to stand. You know the people in your life that need some help in standing. There's probably names going through your head now, maybe family members. They don't need you to cause them to stumble. They need you to take up a position by them and cause them to stand. Led by the Holy Spirit, you'll know what you can do. I just love this. I just love the wood project where you cut wood and you bring it to people. You're coming alongside of people in their time of definite need. You're assisting them. This church, I'm preaching to the church that I'm blown away about that is causing people to stand over and over and over. And I'm just trying to encourage you. It's the right thing to do. It's what Jesus has called us to do. And sometimes we get caught up in these things like that are thought of as worldly by the church of the past. And we think it's that. It's not. It's how we relate to them. Don't 
trip over dumb things. Stay focused on the prize. The third point I want to talk to you about is run to win. Um, I told you my father was rather conservative. And he was conservative for a good reason, because he was a bootleg, he bootlegged whiskey out of Canada, and so he, you know, he had a past. Didn't talk about it too much. When he shuffled old maid cards, which we allowed in the house, <laughs> he would have card tricks he'd do up and down his arm and stuff. So we knew. <laughs> in fact, I grew up thinking the better art that you are at shuffling, probably the worse of a life you've had in your past. <laughs> I <would. laughs> so I, I'm just telling you, I'm not, I wasn't an abused kid, but I, I had to carry some of that baggage with me that my dad hated everything fun, in my view. I'd have to take a note to school when it was square dancing day, and, I'd, and it would excuse Joe from square dancing. I know. <laughs> and so I would sit there on the bleachers and watching all these kids having fun square dancing, thinking of those heathens. Look at him smiling. <laughs> they have no idea what a slippery slope they're going on. <laughs> I grew up in an era where we believe that, we just believe so strongly about that. We thought that uh, premarital sex led to dancing. So, so we had some hang-ups, okay? <laughs> so I'm, I'm in seventh grade, the neighbor lady, Bev Gage, said, we're going to 4-H. Have you ever been to 4-H? I said, no. You should come to 4-H. I said, oh, great. I'll come to 4-H. She picked me up. I jumped in the car with Jeff and Lisa, her kids. I played with them all the time. And we get in the car, and we're starting to go to town, which is 15 miles away. And she starts having the talk with me. And she's trying to put me at ease, which I think is a very Christian thing to do now that I look back on it. But she said, Joey, I want to tell you something, and I don't want you to be nervous. After the judging contest, there is a dance. And I felt, uh-oh. I've been kidnapped. <laughs> and I was probably, you know... We had a lot of hell stories in those days, so I thought, Ooh. So I, I was nervous all the way through the night. We got to the dance at the Ledger Community Hall. They started playing the, those evil records. <laughs> I remember one of them was uh, Green Alligators and Long Necky. Yeah, that one. Turned out it was my favorite for the night. I got out on the floor and started to move. <laughs> Just a little bit. It was awkward. <laughs> then I got pretty good. <laughs> I had sweat running off my head. I was danced all night long. I figured if I was going to sin, I'd go hard. And just go. <laughs> I just might as well go all in. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> That was Saturday night, and we came dragging home at about 10 o'clock, and I got to bed because Dad went to bed earlier than I did. Mom knew what happened. <laughs> she talked to Dad, prepared him, and then I'm laying in bed, and Dad has this routine of waking us up Sunday morning, and he snuck his head in there. I remember his look, <laughs> I remember his look on his face, and he said this. If you dance, you have to pay the piper. I didn't know what that meant, except that he winked. It's time to go to church. Somehow he got past it. 
I thank God a couple of things that I'm the youngest because the first bunch had a harder time with it than I did. But he got past that because he had an understanding of who Jesus was. And it developed through time. And if I could just tell you to do this, give people space when they have troubles with something. Give them space. Let them work through it. And you yourself just understand Jesus and loving him is what this is all about. It's not about food sacrifice to idols or doing something that's a, a habit that you don't like or something that you don't want to do. There's an enormous list of things that we have in our past uh, that we used to call sin and now we don't. We used to not allow women to wear makeup in church. I remember we almost had a church split when one of the ladies wore a pantsuit to church. What does she think she's doing dressing like a man in church? I'm just so sorry that happened. We're living in a day where God wants us to walk in freedom, but he also wants us to walk in, a, in an awareness of the Spirit of God and an awareness of the people around us so that we don't cause them to trip, but we cause them to stand. And we give them an assist in life, a, a help on this journey. And so when they're struggling with some area of, of their life, that's okay. Give them space. First Corinthians chapter 9, he, he starts in chapter 8, and I know I'm covering a lot of territory, but he starts in chapter 8 about food sacrifice to idols, not causing people to stumble. He ends in chapter 9 with this, do you not know that a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not, that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've pre preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Can I just tell you, I'm going to sum this up. Don't trip over dumb things. Run a race intelligently. Don't trip. What trips you up? Let me tell you what trips people up. Unforgiveness, judgmental attitudes, people who don't see things how I see them. Intolerance. I was in the car with my wife and I was bugged about some people in church and I said the one thing I can't tolerate is intolerant people. Yeah. I'm guilty. And I think we all are from time to time. I think if anything, we need to see Jesus for who he is, the answer for people's lives, and that we can come alongside of them and give them an assist, not give them a trip or a stumbling block. And we can't make everybody okay and I'm not asking you to do that I'm just saying what you need to do is be so connected to Jesus that people know who you've been with and people know what the aroma is that you're giving off people know that you are the one who is connected with the Lord and so if they have a trouble in their life or if they have an issue in their life they'll know to come to you and talk with you and you can stand alongside of them and give them an assist I need that so Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he took the cup. <laughs> and he took, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Think about that for a minute. We're in this body of Christ. We're going to pass out communion at this time. And as we do, I want us to uh, just take a minute 
I would like you to take a minute, and as we take communion, not to think about yourself, but to think about those around you that maybe need you to be broken and connected and part of the body to give them an assist, okay? Go ahead and pass it out, guys, and we're going to just listen to Scott for a minute. We're going to just wait for everybody to be served. It's important to do this together for a couple of reasons today because we want to recognize the body of Christ. We want to recognize those around us and be sensitive to them and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Don't be surprised if the Holy Spirit doesn't lead you to somebody after today that you know you were supposed to be sensitive and give them an assist. Give them encouragement. So, St. Paul the Apostle writing to this Corinthian church in chapter 11 says, For this I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant, my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we're so grateful for you. We're so... The ultimate person who causes us to stand... Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, thank you for your body. It was broken. And help us to be broken for you and, and available to those around us. Like the broken bread would give off of the aroma of who you are to the people around us. We ask, Lord, that you would bless it and bless this new commitment we have to you. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that forgives us for our sin. Lord, we, we take a moment now and just ask you to cleanse us from our sin. Make us new. We want to follow you. We need you to be our Lord and Savior of our life. And cause us to stand. In your name we pray. Let's take the emblems together. 